The Watcher by the Threshold, John Buchan. A chill evening in the early October of the year 189 found me driving in a dogcart through the belts of antique woodland which form the lowland limits of the hilly parish of Moor. The Highland Express, which brought me from the north, took me no farther than Perth. Thence it had been a slow journey in a disjointed local train, till I emerged on the platform at Moorfoot, with a bleak prospect of pot stalks, coal heaps, certain sour corn lands, and far to the west the line of moor where the sun was setting. A neat groom and a respectable trap took the edge off my discomfort, and soon I had forgotten my sacrifice and found eyes for the darkening landscape. We were driving through a land of thick woods, cut at rare intervals by old long-frequented highways. The moor, which at Moorfoot is an open sewer, became a sullen woodland stream, where the brown leaves of the season drifted. At times we would pass an ancient lodge, and through a gap in the trees would come a glimpse of chipped crowstep gable. The names of such houses, as told me by my companion, were all famous. This one had been the home of a drunken Jacobite laird, and a king of North Country Merminum. Unholy revels had waked the old halls, and the devil had been toasted at many a hellfire dinner. The next was the property of a great Scots law family, and there the old Lord of Session, who built the place, in his frouzy wig and carpet slippers, had laid down the canons of taste for his day and society. The whole country had the air of faded and bygone gentility. The mossy roadside walls had stood for two hundred years, the few wayside houses were toll bars or defunct hostelries. The names, too, were great, Scots baronial with the smack of France, Comichet Ray and Riverslaw, Black Home and Fountain Blue. The place had a cunning charm, mystery dwelt in every cranny, and yet it did not please me. The earth smelt heavy and raw, the roads were red underfoot, all was old, sorrowful, and uncanny. Compared with the fresh highland glen I had left, where wind and sun and flying showers were never absent, all was chilly and dull and dead. Even when the sun sent a shiver of crimson over the crests of certain firs, I felt no delight in the prospect. I admitted shamefacedly to myself that I was in a very bad temper. I had been staying at Glen Sill with the Clan Roydens and for a week had found the proper pleasure in life. You know the house with its old rooms and gardens, and the miles of heather which defend it from the world. The shooting had been extraordinary for a wild place late in the season, for there are few partridges, and the woodcock are notoriously late. I had done respectably in my stalking, more than respectably on the river, and creditably on the moors. Moreover, there were pleasant people in the house and there were the clanroidens. I had had a hard year's work, sustained to the last moment of term, and a fortnight in Norway had been disastrous. It was therefore with real comfort that I had settled myself down for another ten days in Glen Hill, when all my plans were shattered by Sybil's letter. Sybil is my cousin and my very good friend, and in old days when I was briefless I had fallen in love with her many times. But she very sensibly chose otherwise, and married a man Laidlaw Robert John Laidlaw, who had been at school with me. He was a cheery, good-humoured fellow, a great sportsman, a justice of the peace, and deputy lieutenant for his county, and something of an antiquary in a mild way. He had a box in Leicestershire to which he went in the hunting season, but from February till October he lived in his moorland home. The place was called the House of Moor, and I had shot at it once or twice in recent years. I remembered its loneliness and its comfort, the charming diffident Sybil, and Laidlaw's genial welcome and my recollections set me puzzling again over the letter which that morning had broken into my comfort. You promised us a visit this autumn, Sybil had written, and I wish you would come as soon as you can. So far common politeness. But she had gone on to reveal the fact that Laidlaw was ill, she did not know how, exactly, but something, she thought, about his heart. Then she had signed herself my affectionate cousin, and then had come a short, violent postscript in which, as it were, the fences of convention had been laid low. For heaven's sake, come and see us, she scrawled below. Bob is terribly ill, and I am crazy. Come at once. To cap it she finished with an afterthought, don't bother about bringing doctors. It is not their business. She had assumed that I would come, and dutifully I set out. I could not regret my decision, but I took leave to upbraid my luck. The thought of Glen is ill with the woodcock beginning to arrive and the clanoidens imploring me to stay, 
saddened my journey in the morning, and the murky, koali, midland country of the afternoon completed my depression. The drive through the woodlands of Moor failed to raise my spirits. I was anxious about Sybil and Laidlaw, and this accursed country had always given me a certain eeriness on my first approaching it. You may call it silly, but I have no nerves and am a little susceptible to vague sentiment. It was sheer physical dislike of the rich deep soil, the woody and antique smells, the melancholy roads and trees, and the flavor of old mystery. I am aggressively healthy and wholly philistine. I love clear outlines and strong colors, and more with its half-tints and hazy distances depressed me miserably. Even when the road crept uphill and the trees ended, I found nothing to hearten me in the moorland which succeeded. It was genuine moorland, close on eight hundred feet above the sea, and through it ran this old grass-grown coach road. Low hills rose to the left, and to the right, after some miles of beat, flared the chimneys of pits and oil works. Straight in front the moor ran out into the horizon, and there in the centre was the last dying spark of the sun. The place was as still as the grave save for the crunch of our wheels on the grassy road, but the flaring lights to the north seemed to endow it with life. I have rarely had so keenly the feeling of movement in the inanimate world. It was an unquiet place, and I shivered nervously. Little gleams of lock came from the hollows. The burns were brown with peat and every now and then the rose in the moor jags of sickening red stone. I remembered that Laidlaw had talked about the place as the old Manan, the holy land of the ancient races. I had paid little attention at the time, but now it struck me that the old peoples had been wise in their choice. There was something uncanny in this soil and air. Framed in dank mysterious woods and a country of coal and ironstone, at no great distance from the capital city, it was a sullen relic of a lost barbarism. Over the low hills lay a green pastoral country with bright streams and valleys, but here, in this peaty desert, there were few sheep and little cultivation. The house of Moor was the only dwelling, and, save for the ragged village, the wilderness was given over to the wild things of the hills. The shooting was good, but the best shooting on earth would not persuade me to make my abode in such a place. Laidlaw was ill, well, I did not wonder. You can have uplands without air moors that are not health-giving, and a country life which is more arduous than a townsman's. I shivered again, for I seemed to have passed in a few hours from the open noon to a kind of dank twilight. We passed the village and entered the lodge gates. Here there were trees again little innocent new-planted firs, which flourished ill. Some large plain trees grew near the house, and there were thickets upon thickets of the ugly elderberry. Even in the half-darkness I could see that the lawns were trim and the flower beds respectable for the season, doubtless Sybil looked after the gardeners. The oblong whitewashed house, more like a barrack than ever, opened suddenly on my sight, and I experienced my first sense of comfort since I left Glen Isil. Here I should find warmth and company, and sure enough, the hall door was wide open, and in the great flood of light which poured from it Sybil stood to welcome me. She ran down the steps as I dismounted, and, with a word to the groom, caught my arm and drew me into the shadow. Oh, Henry, it was so good of you to come. You mustn't let Bob think that you know he is ill. We don't talk about it. I'll tell you afterwards. I want you to cheer him up. Now we must go in, for he is in the hall expecting you. While I stood blinking in the light, Laidlaw came forward with outstretched hand and his usual cheery greeting. I looked at him and saw nothing unusual in his appearance, a little drawn at the lips, perhaps, and heavy below the eyes, but still fresh-coloured and healthy. It was Sybil who showed change. She was very pale. Her pretty eyes were deplorably mournful, and in place of her delightful shyness there were the self-confidence and composure of pain. I was honestly shocked, and as I dressed my heart was full of hard thoughts about Laidlaw. What could his illness mean? He seemed well and cheerful while Sybil was pale, and yet it was Sybil who had written the postscript. As I warmed myself by the fire, I resolved that this particular family difficulty was my proper business. The Laidlaws were waiting for me in the drawing room. I noticed something new and strange in Sybil's demeanor. She looked to her husband with a motherly, protective air, while Laidlaw, who had been the extreme of masculine independence, seemed to cling to his wife with a curious appealing fidelity. In conversation he did little more than echo her words. Till dinner was announced he spoke of the weather, the shooting, 
and Mabel Clan Royden. Then he did a queer thing, for when I was about to offer my arm to Sybil he forestalled me, and clutching her right arm with his left hand led the way to the dining room, leaving me to follow in some bewilderment. I have rarely taken part in a more dismal meal. The house of Moore has a pretty Georgian panelling through most of the rooms, but in the dining room the walls are level and painted a dull stone colour. Abraham offered up Isaac in a ghastly picture in front of me. Some photographs of the Quorn hung over the mantelpiece, and five or six drab ancestors filled up the remaining space. But one thing was new and startling. A great marble bust, a genuine antique, frowned on me from a pedestal. The head was in the late Roman style, clearly of some emperor, and in its commonplace environment the great brows, the massive neck, and the mysterious solemn lips had a surprising effect. I nodded toward the thing, and asked what it represented. Laidlaw grunted something which I took for Justinian, but he never raised his eyes from his plate. By accident I caught Sybil's glance. She looked toward the bust, and laid a finger on her lips. The meal grew more doleful as it advanced. Sybil scarcely touched a dish, but her husband ate ravenously of everything. He was a strong, thick-set man with a square kindly face burned brown by the sun. Now he seemed to have suddenly coarsened. He gobbled with undignified haste, and his eye was extraordinarily vacant. A question made him start, and he would turn on me a face so strange and inert that I repented the interruption. I asked him about the autumn's sport. He collected his wits with difficulty. He thought it had been good, on the whole, but he had shot badly. He had not been quite so fit as usual. No, he had had nobody staying with him. Sybil had wanted to be alone. He was afraid the moor might have been undershot, but he would make a big day with keepers and farmers before the winter. Bob has done pretty well, Sybil said. He hasn't been out tofen, for the weather has been very bad here. You can have no idea, Henry, how horrible this moorland place of ours can be when it dries. It is one great sponge sometimes, with ugly red burns and mud to the ankles. I don't think it's healthy, said I, Laidlaw lifted his face. Nor do I. I think it's intolerable, but I am so busy I can't get away. Once again I caught Sybil's warning eye as I was about to question him on his business. Clearly the man's brain had received a shock, and he was beginning to suffer from hallucinations. This could be the only explanation, for he had always led a temperate life. The distray, wandering manner was the only sign of his malady, for otherwise he seemed normal and mediocre as ever. My heart grieved for Sybil, alone with him in this wilderness, then he broke the silence. He lifted his head and looked nervously around till his eye fell on the Roman bust. Do you know that this countryside is the old man Anne? He said. It was an odd turn to the conversation, but I was glad of a sign of intelligence. I answered that I had heard so, it's a queer name. He said oracularly, but the thing it stood for was queerer, Menan, Menor, he repeated, rolling the words on his tongue. As he spoke, he glanced sharply, and, as it seemed to me, fearfully, at his left side. The movement of his body made his napkin slip from his left knee and fall on the floor. It leaned against his leg, and he started from its touch as if he had been bitten by a snake. I have never seen a more sheer and transparent terror on a man's face. He got to his feet, his strong frame shaking like a rush. Sybil ran round to his side, picked up the napkin and flung it on a sideboard. Then she stroked his hair as one would stroke a frightened horse. She called him by his old boy's name of Robin, and at her touch and voice he became quiet. But the particular cause then in progress was removed, untasted. In a few minutes he seemed to have forgotten his behavior, for he took up the former conversation. For a time he spoke well and briskly. You lawyers, he said, understand only the dry framework of the past. You cannot conceive the rapture, which only the antiquary can feel, of constructing in every detail an old culture. Take this man on. If I could explore the secret of these moors, I would write the world's greatest book. I would write of that prehistoric life when man was knit close to nature. I would describe the people who were brothers of the red earth and the red rock and the red streams of the hills. Oh, it would be horrible, but superb, tremendous. It would be more than a piece of history, it would be a new gospel, a new theory of life. It would kill materialism once and for all. Why, man, 
all the poets who have deified and personified nature would not do an eighth part of my work. I would show you the unknown, the hideous, shrieking mystery at the back of this simple nature. Men would see the profundity of the old crude faiths which they affect to despise. I would make a picture of our shaggy, sombre-eyed forefather, who heard strange things in the hill silences. I would show him brutal and terror-stricken, but wise, wise, God alone knows how wise. The Romans knew it, and they learned what they could from him, though he did not tell them much. But we have some of his blood in us, and we may go deeper. Menan. A queer land nowadays. I sometimes love it and sometimes hate it, but I always fear it. It is like that statue, inscrutable. I would have told him that he was talking mystical nonsense, but I had looked toward the bust, and my rudeness was checked on my lips. The moor might be a common piece of ugly waste land, but the statue was inscrutable, comma of that there was no doubt. I hate your cruel heavy-mouthed Roman busts, to me they have none of the beauty of life, and little of the interest of art. But my eyes were fastened on this as they had never before looked on marble. The oppression of the heavy woodlands, the mystery of the silent moor, seemed to be caught and held in this face. It was the intangible mystery of culture on the verge of savagery a cruel, lustful wisdom, and yet a kind of bitter austerity which laughed at the game of life and stood aloof. There was no weakness in the heavy-veined brow and slumberous eyelids. It was the face of one who had conquered the world, and found it dust and ashes, one who had eaten of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and scorned human wisdom. And at the same time, it was the face of one who knew uncanny things, a man who was the intimate of the half-world and the dim background of life. Why on earth I should connect the Roman grandee, with the moorland parish of Moor I cannot say but the fact remains that there was that in the face which I knew had haunted me through the woodlands and bogs of the place a sleepless, dismal, incoherent melancholy, I have identified the bust, which, when seen under other circumstances, had little power to affect me. It was a copy of the head of Justinian in the Tessie Museum at Venice, and several duplicates exist, dating apparently from the 7th century, and showing traces of Byzantine decadence in the scroll work on the hair. It is engraved in M. Delacroix's Byzantium, and, I think, in Winscheid's Pandectan which, I bought that at Colnzo's, Laidlaw said, because it took my fancy. It matches well with this place, I thought it matched very ill with his drab walls and corn photographs, but I held my peace, do you know who it is? He asked. It is the head of the greatest man the world has ever seen. You are a lawyer and know your Justinian. The Pandects are scarcely part of the daily work of a common law barrister. I had not looked into them since I left college, I know that he married an actress, I said, and was a sort of all-round genius. He made law, and fought battles, and had rose with the church. A curious man. And wasn't there some story about his selling his soul to the devil, and getting law in exchange? Rather a poor bargain, I chattered away, sillily enough, to dispel the gloom of that dinner table. The result of my words was unhappy. Laidlaw gasped and caught at his left side, as if in pain. Sybil, with tragic eyes, had been making signs to me to hold my peace. Now she ran round to her husband's side and comforted him like a child. As she passed me, she managed to whisper in my ear to talk to her only, and let her husband alone. For the rest of dinner I obeyed my orders to the letter. Laidlaw ate his food in gloomy silence, while I spoke to Sybil of our relatives and friends, of London, Glenys Hill, and any random subject. The poor girl was dismally forgetful, and her eye would wander to her husband with wifely anxiety. I remember being suddenly overcome by the comic aspect of it all. Here were we three fools alone in the dank upland, one of us sick and nervous, talking out of the way nonsense about Menan and Justinian, gobbling his food and getting scared at his napkin another gravely anxious, and myself at my wit's end for a solution. It was a mad tea party with a vengeance, Sybil the melancholy little dormouse, and Laidlaw the incomprehensible hatter. I laughed aloud, but checked myself when I caught my cousin's eye. It was really no case for finding humour. Laidlaw was very ill, and Sybil's face was getting deplorably thin. I welcomed the end of that meal with unmannerly joy, for I wanted to speak seriously with my host. Sybil told the butler to have the lamps lighted in the library. Then she leaned over toward me and spoke low and rapidly, 
I want you to talk with Bob. I'm sure you can do him good. You'll have to be very patient with him, and very gentle. Oh, please try to find out what is wrong with him. He won't tell me, and I can only guess. The butler returned with word that the library was ready to receive us, and Sybil rose to go. Laidlaw half rose, protesting, making the most curious feeble clutches to his side. His wife quieted him. Henry will look after you, dear, she said. You are going into the library to smoke. Then she slipped from the room, and we were left alone. He caught my arm fiercely with his left hand, and his grip nearly made me cry out. As we walked down the hall, I could feel his arm twitching from the elbow to the shoulder. Clearly he was in pain, and I set it down to some form of cardiac affection, which might possibly issue in paralysis. I settled him in the biggest armchair, and took one of his cigars. The library is the pleasantest room in the house, and at night, when a peat fire burned on the old hearth and the great red curtains were drawn, it used to be the place for comfort and good talk. Now I noticed changes. Laidlaw's bookshelves had been filled with the proceedings of antiquarian societies and many light-hearted works on sport. But now the badminton library had been cleared out of a shelf where it stood most convenient to the hand, and its place taken by an old Leiden reprint of Justinian. There were books on Byzantine subjects of which I never dreamed he had heard the names, there were volumes of history and speculation, all of a slightly bizarre kind, and to crown everything, there were several bulky medical works with gaudily colored plates. The old atmosphere of sport and travel had gone from the room with the medley of rods, whips, and gun cases which used to cumber the tables. Now the place was moderately tidy and somewhat learned, and I did not like it. Laidlaw refused to smoke, and sat for a little while in silence. Then of his own accord he broke the tension. It was devilish good of you to come, Harry. This is a lonely place for a man who is a bit seedy. I thought you might be alone, I said, so I looked you up on my way down from Glenesil. I'm sorry to find you feeling ill. Do you notice it? He asked sharply. It's tolerably patent, I said. Have you seen a doctor? He said something uncomplimentary about doctors, and kept looking at me with his curious dull eyes. I remarked the strange posture in which he sat, his head screwed round to his right shoulder, and his whole body a protest against something at his left hand. It looks like a heart, I said. You seem to have pains in your left side, again a spasm of fear. I went over to him and stood at the back of his chair. Now for goodness sake, my dear fellow, tell me what is wrong. You're scaring Sybil to death. It's lonely work for the poor girl, and I wish you would let me help you. He was lying back in his chair now, with his eyes half shut, and shivering like a frightened colt. The extraordinary change in one who had been the strongest of the strong kept me from realizing his gravity. I put a hand on his shoulder, but he flung it off, to God's sake, sit down. He said hoarsely. I'm going to tell you, but I'll never make you understand. I sat down promptly opposite him, it's the devil, he said very solemnly, I am afraid that I was rude enough to laugh. He took no notice, but sat, with the same tense, miserable air, staring over my head, right, said I. Then it is the devil. It's a new complaint, so it's as well I did not bring a doctor. How does it affect you? He made the old impotent clutch at the air with his left hand. I had the sense to become grave at once. Clearly this was some serious mental affection, some hallucination born of physical pain. Then he began to talk in a low voice, very rapidly, with his head bent forward like a hunted animal's. I am not going to set down what he told me in his own words, for they were incoherent often, and there was much repetition. But I am going to write the gist of the odd story which took my sleep away on that autumn night, with such explanations and additions I think needful. The fire died down, the wind arose, the hour grew late, and still he went on in his mumbling recitative. I forgot to smoke, forgot my comfort everything but the odd figure of my friend and his inconceivable romance. And the night before I had been in cheerful Glenesil. He had returned to the house of Moor, he said, in the latter part of May, and shortly after he fell ill. It was a trifling sickness, comma, influenza or something, comma, but he had never quite recovered. The rainy weather of June depressed him and the extreme heat of July made him listless and weary. A kind of insistent sleepiness hung over him, and he suffered much from nightmare. 
Toward the end of July his former health returned, but he was haunted with a curious oppression. He seemed to himself to have lost the art of being alone. There was a perpetual sound in his left ear, a kind of moving and rustling at his left side, which never left him by night or day. In addition, he had become the prey of nerves and an insensate dread of the unknown. Laidlaw, as I have explained, was a commonplace man, with fair talents, a mediocre culture, honest instincts, and the beliefs and incredulities of his class. On abstract grounds, I should have declared him an unlikely man to be the victim of an hallucination. He had a kind of dull bourgeois rationalism, which used to find reasons for all things in heaven and earth. At first he controlled his dread with proverbs. He told himself it was the sequel of his illness or the light-headedness of summer heat on the moors. But it soon outgrew his comfort. It became a living second presence, an alter ego which dogged his footsteps. He grew acutely afraid of it. He dared not be alone for a moment, and clung to Sybil's company despairingly. She went off for a week's visit in the beginning of August, and he endured for seven days the tortures of the lost. The malady advanced upon him with swift steps. The presence became more real daily. In the early dawning, in the twilight, and in the first hour of the morning it seemed at times to take a visible bodily form. A kind of amorphous featureless shadow would run from his side into the darkness, and he would sit palsied with terror. Sometimes, in lonely places, his footsteps sounded double, and something would brush elbows with him. Human society alone exorcised it. With Sybil at his side he was happy, but as soon as she left him, the thing came slinking back from the unknown to watch by him. Company might have saved him, but joined to his affliction was a crazy dread of his fellows. He would not leave his moorland home, but must bear his burden alone among the wild streams and mosses of that dismal place. The twelfth came, and he shot wretchedly, for his nerve had gone to pieces. He stood exhaustion badly, and became a dweller about the doors. But with this bodily inertness came an extraordinary intellectual revival. He read widely in a blundering way, and he speculated unceasingly. It was characteristic of the man that as soon as he left the paths of the prosaic he should seek his supernatural in a very concrete form. He assumed that he was haunted by the devil the visible personal devil in whom our fathers believed. He waited hourly for the shape at his side to speak, but no words came. The accuser of the brethren in all but tangible form was his ever-present companion. He felt, he declared, the spirit of old evil entering subtly into his blood. He sold his soul many times over, and yet there was no possibility of resistance. It was a visitation more undeserved than Job's, and a thousandfold more awful. For a week or more he was tortured with a kind of religious mania. When a man of a healthy secular mind finds himself adrift on the terrible ocean of religious troubles he is peculiarly helpless, for he has not the most rudimentary knowledge of the winds and tides. It was useless to call up his old carelessness. He had suddenly dropped into a new world where old proverbs did not apply. And all the while, mind you, there was the shrinking terror of it an intellect all alive to the torture and the most unceasing physical fear. For a little he was on the far edge of idiocy. Then by accident it took a new form. While sitting with Sybil one day in the library, he began listlessly to turn over the leaves of an old book. He read a few pages, and found the hint to a story like his own. It was some French life of Justinian, one of the unscholarly productions of last century, made up of stories from Procopius and tags of Roman law. Here was his own case written down in black and white, and the man had been a king of kings. This was a new comfort and for a little strange though it may seem he took a sort of pride in his affliction. He worshipped the great emperor, and read every scrap he could find on him, not excepting the pandects and the digest. He sent for the bust in the dining room, paying a fabulous price. Then he settled himself to study his imperial prototype, and the study became an idolatry. As I have said, Laidlaw was a man of ordinary talents, and certainly of meagre imaginative power and yet from the lies of the secret history and the crudities of German legalists he had constructed a marvellous portrait of a man. Sitting there in the half-lighted room, he drew the picture, the quiet cold man with his inheritance of Dacian mysticism, holding the great world in fee, giving it law and religion, fighting its wars, 
building its churches, and yet all the while intent upon his own private work of making his peace with his soul the churchman and warrior whom all the world worshipped, and yet one going through life with his lip quivering. He watched by the threshold ever at the left side. Sometimes at night, in the great brazen palace, warders heard the emperor walking in the dark corridors, alone, and yet not alone, for once, when a servant entered with a lamp, he saw his master with a face as of another world, and something beside him which had no face or shape, but which he knew to be that hoary evil which is older than the stars, crazy nonsense. I had to rub my eyes to assure myself that I was not sleeping. No. There was my friend with his suffering face, and it was the library of more. And then he spoke of Theodora, comma, actress, harlot, devout, empress. For him the lady was but another part of the uttermost horror, a form of the shapeless thing at his side. I felt myself falling under the fascination. I have no nerves and little imagination, but in a flash I seemed to realize something of that awful featureless face, crouching ever at a man's hand, till darkness and loneliness come, and it rises to its mastery. I shivered as I looked at the man in the chair before me. These dull eyes of his were looking upon things I could not see, and I saw their terror. I realized that it was grim earnest for him. Nonsense or no, some devilish fancy had usurped the place of his sanity, and he was being slowly broken upon the wheel. And then, when his left hand twitched, I almost cried out. I had thought it comic before. Now it seemed the last proof of tragedy. He stopped, and I got up with loose knees and went to the window. Better the black night than the intangible horror within. I flung up the sash and looked out across the moor. There was no light, nothing but an inky darkness and the uncanny rustle of elder bushes. The sound chilled me, and I closed the window. The land is the old manan, Laidlaw was saying. We are beyond the pale here. Do you hear the wind? I forced myself back into sanity and looked at my watch. It was nearly one o'clock, what ghastly idiots we are. I said. I am off to bed, Laidlaw looked at me helplessly. For God's sake, don't leave me alone. He moaned. Get Sybil. We went together back to the hall, while he kept the same feverish grasp on my arm. Someone was sleeping in a chair by the hall fire, and to my distress I recognized my hostess. The poor child must have been sadly wearied. She came forward with her anxious face. I'm afraid Bob has kept you very late, Henry, she said. I hope you will sleep well. Breakfast at nine, you know. And then I left them. Over my bed there was a little picture, a reproduction of some Italian work, of Christ and a demoniac. Some impulse made me hold my candle up to it. The madman's face was tongued with passion and suffering, and his eye had the pained furtive expression which I had come to know. And by his left side there was a dim shape crouching. I got into bed hastily, but not to sleep. I felt that my reason must be going. I had been pitchforked from our clear and cheerful modern life into the mists of old superstition. Old tragic stories of my Calvinist upbringing returned to haunt me. The man dwelt in by a devil was no new fancy, but I believed that science had docketed and analyzed and explained the devil out of the world. I remembered my dabblings in the occult before I settled down to law the story of Donius Arius, the monk of Padua, the unholy legend of the face of Proserpine the tales of succubi and incubi, the lianane scythe and the hidden presence. But here was something stranger still. I had stumbled upon the very possession which fifteen hundred years ago had made the monks of New Rome tremble and cross themselves. Some devilish occult force, lingering through the ages, had come to life after a long sleep. God knows what earthly connection there was between the splendid emperor of the world and my prosaic friend or between the glittering shores of the Bosporus and this moorland parish. But the land was the old manan. The spirit may have lingered in the earth and air, a deadly legacy from Pict and Roman. I had felt the uncanniness of the place, I had augured ill of it from the first. And then in sheer disgust I rose and splashed my face with cold water. I lay down again, laughing miserably at my credulity. That I, the sober and rational, should believe in this crazy fable was too palpably absurd. I would steel my mind resolutely against such harebrain theories. It was a mere bodily ailment liver out of order, weak heart, bad circulation, or something of that sort. At the worst it might be some affection of the brain, to be treated by a specialist. 
I vowed to myself that next morning the best doctor in Edinburgh should be brought to Moore. The worst of it was that my duty compelled me to stand my ground. I foresaw the few remaining weeks of my holiday blighted. I should be tied to this moorland prison, a sort of keeper and nurse in one, tormented by silly fancies. It was a charming prospect, and the thought of Glenay's Hill and the Woodcock made me bitter against Laidlaw. But there was no way out of it. I might do Laidlaw good, and I could not have Sybil worn to death by his vagaries. My ill nature comforted me, and I forgot the horror of the thing in its vexation. After that I think I fell asleep and dozed uneasily till morning. When I woke I was in a better frame of mind. The early sun had worked wonders with the moorland. The low hills stood out fresh-coloured and clear against a pale October sky, the elders sparkled with frost, the raw film of morn was rising from the little lock in tiny clouds. It was a cold, rousing day, and I dressed in good spirits and went down to breakfast, I found Laidlaw looking ruddy and well, very different from the broken man I remembered of the night before. We were alone, for Sybil was breakfasting in bed. I remarked on his ravenous appetite, and he smiled cheerily. He made two jokes during the meal, he laughed often, and I began to forget the events of the previous day. It seemed to me that I might still flee from more with a clear conscience. He had forgotten about his illness. When I touched distantly upon the matter he showed a blank face, it might be that the affection had passed, on the other hand, it might return to him at the darkening. I had no means to decide. His manner was still a trifle distray and peculiar and I did not like the dullness in his eye. At any rate, I should spend the day in his company, and the evening would decide the question, I proposed shooting, which he promptly vetoed. He was no good at walking, he said, and the birds were wild. This seriously limited the possible occupations. Fishing there was none, and hill climbing was out of the question. He proposed a game at billiards, and I pointed to the glory of the morning. It would have been sacrilege to waste such sunshine in knocking balls about. Finally we agreed to drive somewhere and have lunch, and he ordered the dog cart, in spite of all forebodings I enjoyed the day. We drove in the opposite direction from the woodland parts, right away across the moor to the coal country beyond. We lunched at the little mining town of Boromir, in a small and noisy public house. The roads made bad going. The country was far from pretty and yet the drive did not bore me. Laidlaw talked incessantly talked as I had never heard man talk before. There was something indescribable in all he said, a different point of view, a lost groove of thought, a kind of innocence and archaic shrewdness in one. I can only give you a hint of it, by saying that it was like the mind of an early ancestor placed suddenly among modern surroundings. It was wise with a remote wisdom, and silly, now and then, with a quite antique and distant silliness. I will give instances of both. He provided me with a theory of certain early fortifications, which must be true, which commends itself to the mind with overwhelming conviction, and yet which is so out of the way of common speculation that no man could have guessed it. I do not propose to set down the details, for I am working at it on my own account. Again, he told me the story of an old marriage custom which till recently survived in this district told it with full circumstantial detail and constant allusions to other customs which he could not possibly have known of. Now for the other side. He explained why well water is in winter warmer than a running stream, and this was his explanation, at the antipodes our winter is summer, consequently, the water of a well which comes through from the other side of the earth must be warm in winter and cold in summer, since in our summer it is winter there. You perceive what this is. It is no mere silliness, but a genuine effort of an early mind, which had just grasped the fact of the antipodes, to use it in explanation. Gradually I was forced to the belief that it was not Laidlaw who was talking to me, but something speaking through him, something at once wiser and simpler. My old fear of the devil began to depart. This spirit, the exhalation, whatever it was, was ingenuous in its way, at least in its daylight aspect. For a moment I had an idea that it was a real reflex of Byzantine thought, and that by cross-examining I might make marvellous discoveries. The ardour of the scholar began to rise in me, and I asked a question about that much debated point, the legal status of the apocrisy area. To my vexation he gave no response. Clearly the intelligence of this familiar had its limits, it was about three in the afternoon, 
and we had gone half of our homeward journey, when signs of the old terror began to appear. I was driving, and Laidlaw sat on my left. I noticed him growing nervous and silent, shivering at the flick of the whip, and turning halfway round toward me. Then he asked me to change places, and I had the unpleasant work of driving from the wrong side. After that I do not think he spoke once till we arrived at Moor, but sat huddled together, with the driving rug almost up to his chin an eccentric figure of man. I foresaw another such night as the last, and I confess my heart sank. I had no stomach for more mysteries, and somehow with the approach of twilight the confidence of the day departed. The thing appeared in darker colors, and I found it in my mind to turn coward. Sybil alone deterred me. I could not bear to think of her alone with this demented being. I remembered her shy timidity, her innocence. It was monstrous that the poor thing should be called on thus to fight alone with phantoms. When we came to the house it was almost sunset. Laidlaw got out very carefully on the right side, and for a second stood by the horse. The sun was making our shadows long, and as I stood beyond him it seemed for a moment that his shadow was double. It may have been mere fancy, for I had not time to look twice. He was standing, as I have said, with his left side next the horse. Suddenly the harmless elderly cob fell into a very panic of fright, reared upright, and all but succeeded in killing its master. I was in time to pluck Laidlaw from under its feet, but the beast had become perfectly unmanageable, and we left a groom struggling to quiet it. In the hall the butler gave me a telegram. It was from my clerk, summoning me back at once to an important consultation. Here was a prompt removal of my scruples. There could be no question of my remaining, for the case was one of the first importance, which I had feared might break off my holiday. The consultation fell in vacation time to meet the convenience of certain people who were going abroad, and there was the most instant demand for my presence. I must go, and at once, and, as I hunted in the timetable, I found that in three hours' time a night train for the south would pass Boromir which might be stopped by special wire. But I had no pleasure in my freedom. I was in despair about Sybil, and I hated myself for my cowardly relief. The dreary dining room the sinister bust, and Laidlaw crouching and quivering the recollection, now that escape was before me, came back on my mind with the terror of a nightmare. My first thought was to persuade the Laidlaws to come away with me. I found them both in the drawing room Sybil very fragile and pale, and her husband sitting as usual like a frightened child in the shadow of her skirts. A sight of him was enough to dispel my hope. The man was fatally ill, mentally, bodily, and who was I to attempt to minister to a mind diseased? But Sybil she might be saved from the martyrdom. The servants would take care of him, and, if need be, a doctor might be got from Edinburgh to live in the house. So while he sat with vacant eyes staring into the twilight, I tried to persuade Sybil to think of herself. I am frankly a sun worshipper. I have no taste for arduous duty, and the quixotic is my abhorrence. I labored to bring my cousin to this frame of mind. I told her that her first duty was to herself, and that this vigil of hers was beyond human endurance. But she had no ears for my arguments, while Bob is ill I must stay with him, she said always in answer, and then she thanked me for my visit, till I felt a brute and a coward. I strove to quiet my conscience, but it told me always that I was fleeing from my duty, and then, when I was on the brink of a nobler resolution, a sudden overmastering terror would take hold of me and I would listen hysterically for the sound of the dog cart on the gravel. At last it came, and in a sort of fever I tried to say the conventional farewells. I shook hands with Laidlaw, and when I dropped his hand it fell numbly on his knee. Then I took my leave, muttering hoarse nonsense about having had a charming visit, and hoping soon to see them both in town. As I backed to the door, I knocked over a lamp on a small table. It crashed on the floor and went out and at the sound Laidlaw gave a curious childish cry. I turned like a coward, and ran across the hall to the front door, and scrambled into the dog cart. The groom would have driven me sedately through the park, but I must have speed or go mad. I took the reins from him and put the horse into a canter. We swung through the gates and out into the moor road, for I could have no peace till the ghoulish elder world was exchanged for the homely ugliness of civilization. Once only I looked back and there against the skyline, with a solitary lit window, the house of Moor stood lonely in the red desert.